Welcome to the series of the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. We are into study number 19 of a 24-part series. And our study tonight is The Other Woman. Let's begin with a story found in Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 26. King Herod's wife, Herodias, hated John the Baptist. The desert-dwelling prophet had dared to call her an adulteress for leaving her husband Philip to marry his evil and wealthier brother. Now the wicked queen determined to use her influence over Herod to get even with John. First, she persuaded him to have John imprisoned. Then she asked to have John executed, but Herod refused. He knew that John was a true prophet of God and feared political backlash from the people. Finally, Herodias developed a foolproof scheme. She threw a party for Herod's birthday and invited all his friends and the nobles from his realm. Then she arranged for a beautiful daughter, Salome, to dance in a seductive, captivating style. Herodias hoped that after Herod had a few glasses of wine, he would ask Salome what she wanted as a reward for an enchanting dance. Her sinister plan worked. After Salome's dance, Herod made a pompous oath. Whatsoever thou shalt ask of me, I will give it to thee, even unto half of my kingdom. Mark 6, 23. As the intoxicated guests were applauding the king's generosity, the girl quickly ran to her mother and was ready with a reply. Then she shocked everyone by asking for the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The Bible says, And she went forth and said unto her mother, What shall I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. Mark 6, 24. Herod was stunned by the gruesome request but all of his shock friends were waiting and watching for the response. Afraid that he would appear weak if he refused, the proud king reluctantly gave the order. That very day, the mighty prophet John was beheaded in prison. Dearly beloved, this was not the first time that a mother and daughter teamed up to use the government to persecute God's people. The Apostle Paul in Acts 17 tells of the church members in the city of Berea and how after they heard the message, they went home and studied the scriptures to see if it were all true, to study for themselves. Beloved, we desire the same of you. Each evening during this prophecy series, we will make available a free offer that goes along with the topic of the evening. I hope you will request your free copy so that you too may come to know the truth that can be found only in the Bible. To get tonight's offer, just visit the website or call us on the number listed on the screen and we will send it to you. And after you read it, make sure to share it with a friend. Let's begin with our first question tonight. What other mother and daughter team persecuted God's people in the Old Testament? Let's see what the scripture says. Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord. 1 Kings 1813. If Cain slew one righteous man, his own brother, Abel, here we have a wicked queen slaying many righteous men who were prophets of God. 
What a terrible crime that was. Jezebel's daughter, Athalia, was even worse than her mother. We read about Athalia. And when Athalia saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. 2 Kings 11 verse 1. The wicked queen Athalia kills all her family members so that she could sit on the throne and rule. Now, who would ever do that to one's own family? But by God's providence, one of her grandsons, a little boy, was preserved. Yes, in the Old Testament, Jezebel and her daughter Athalia were known for violently controlling the northern and the southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah and forcing all the people into pagan worship. And those who were on God's side resisted and were punished. Let's go to our second question. What is the second angel's message in Revelation chapter 14? The Bible says, And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Revelation 14.8. Now, Revelation 14 contains an urgent three-point message that must reach the entire world before Jesus comes the second time. In this lesson, we will look at the second point of that message, also called the second angel's message. God's charge of Babylon is, she has made all nations drink of the intoxicating wine. In this lesson, we'll address some very straight and perhaps disturbing messages to all Christians, both Catholic and Protestant believers. But remember, when the language of scripture is strong, it means the message is of paramount importance and very urgent. When the language of the Bible is strong, it is because God's love is strong and he wants to do anything and everything to wake his people up. Do not forget that the second angel's message is from Jesus, the one whom we all love, and the one who loves all of us and who died to save us. So open your heart to his truth, for his only aim is to save and bless you. Let's go to our third question. How does God symbolize Babylon in Revelation 17? The Bible says, And the woman which thou sawest, is the great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, verse 18. In Bible prophecy, a woman symbolizes a church. A pure woman represents God's true church, as described in Revelation chapter 12. We have seen in our study number 17, the bride of Christ about the pure woman. An unfaithful woman, on the other hand, represents a church that has departed from Scripture by compromising with the world and its rulers and the things of this world. Who is this unfaithful woman in Revelation chapter 17? We have a clue in verse 18, which says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now in John's time, the great city which was ruling over the kings of the earth was the Roman kingdom from the city of Rome. In the Gospel of Luke, we read about Caesar Augustus, who was ruling the Roman Empire when the Lord Jesus was born. In Luke 2 and verse 1, it says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree 
from Caesar Augustus that the whole world should be taxed. They taxed the whole world because the Caesars of Rome were ruling the entire world. History tells us that it was pagan Rome in Luke 2 verse 1 that eventually turned over its authority, capital city, and power to papal Rome. Which woman or which church took the place of the Roman kingdom which was ruling the world? History, beloved, tells us papal Rome took the rulership from pagan Rome. A Roman Catholic writes, and I quote, Long ages ago, when Rome, through the neglect of the Western emperors, was left to the mercy of the barbarous hordes, the Romans turned to one figure for aid and protection and asked him to help to rule over them. And thus commenced the temporal sovereignty of the popes and meekly stepping to the throne of Caesar, the wicker of Christ took up the scepter to which the emperors and kings of Europe were to bow in reverence through so many ages." Unquote. American Catholic Quarterly Review, April 1911. Let's go to question number four. What other evidence from Revelation 17 proves that Babylon refers to papal Rome? A. She is guilty of blasphemy. Revelation 17.3 says, I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Let me quote from their own sources. I quote, the Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the wicker of God. Ferrar, Ferraris Ecclesiastical Dictionary. On April 29, 1922, in the Vatican throne room, a throng of cardinals, bishops, priests, nuns, boys and girls, who had all fallen on their knees in reverence to the one before them, were then addressed from the throne by Pope Pius XI. Here is a passage from the book, Bulwark, October 1922, page 104. This is what Pope Pius XI said, and I quote, You know that I am the Holy Father, the representative of God on earth, the wicker of Christ, which means I am God on earth, unquote. Yes, she is guilty of blasphemy. B, she is dressed in purple and scarlet. Revelation 17, 4 says, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color. Purple in scripture stands for royalty. In Judges 8, 26, we read, purple raiment that was on kings. This woman is a queen that rules. Scarlet color represents sin in the Bible. Isaiah 1.18 says, though your sins be as scarlet. In 2 Thessalonians 2.3, the leader of this institution is called the man of sin because this institution causes people to sin by transgressing God's law for it attempted to change God's times and laws. As we saw in our study number 13, who is the Antichrist? Interestingly, scarlet is the color of the robes of the cardinals, and the Pope often wears the royal color of purple at important functions. How can anyone not see the color clues given here? The Bible also says, and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. Verse 4 of Revelation 17. Is this church rich and adorned with gold and other precious treasures? 
I want to quote from the book written by Havro Manhattan entitled The Vatican Billions. I quote, The Catholic Church is the biggest financial power, wealth accumulator, and property owner in existence. She is a greater possessor of material riches than any other single institution, corporation, bank, giant trust, government, or state of the whole globe. The Pope, as the visible ruler of this immense amassment of wealth, is consequently the richest individual of the 20th century. No one can realistically assess how much he is worth in terms of billions of dollars." Unquote. Indeed, that description of Revelation 17.4, which says, she is adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, perfectly fits the Roman church. See, she is called the mother in verse 5. She's called the Mother Church in Christianity. Isn't that right? The sacred Lateranian Mother and the head of all churches of the city of and the world. This is their own quote. I want to quote a newspaper, The Independent, by Lloyd Rundle on Monday, 4 September 2000. I quote, The Vatican has decreed that the Catholic Church is the mother of all churches and banned the term sister churches to describe other denominations in two new documents that could harm Vatican efforts towards unity with other believers. In a letter to bishops worldwide on Saturday, Pope John Paul's two chief theological advisor, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, said it was incorrect to call Christian churches ranging from Protestant to Orthodox, sister churches of the Catholic Church. The Cardinal said the term was sloppy terminology and could not be used to describe Christian communities that were not actually in communion with Rome. It must be always clear that the one holy Catholic and apostolic universal church is not the sister, but the mother of all churches, the Cardinal said, unquote. Remember Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger later became the Pope with the name Pope Benedict the 16. Yes, that description of Revelation 17.5, where the church is called mother, perfectly fits. D. She has harlot daughters who also are fallen. Revelation 17 and verse 5. It says, the mother of harlots. So it means she has produced daughters just like her, who ended up being unfaithful to Jesus Christ, the true husband of the church. The Protestant churches, we all know, came out from the Catholic Church, the Mother Church. They protested her for not following the Word of God. Therefore, they are called Protestants. But God is protesting against them as well for following their mother in compromised Christianity and not following the truth fully. Notice this quote from Father James A. O'Brien. I quote, That observance of Sunday instead of Saturday remains as a reminder of the mother church from which the non-Catholic sects broke away. Unquote. The Faith of Millions, page 401. So this description also perfectly fits the harlot daughters who are also fallen along with the mother. E, she persecuted and martyred 
the saints. Revelation 17 and verse 6 says, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Remember, persecution was not new to John the Apostle. Pagan Rome under Nero persecuted the Christians of the first century. And John's own uh, colleagues, the apostles, were all killed under the Roman rule. Even the Lord Jesus Christ suffered and died under the pagan rule of Rome. But when John saw this woman drunken with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, the Bible says, he wondered with great admiration. The reason is, this persecuting power was a woman or a church. In the name of Christ, they were massacring Christians. Jesus said in John 16 and verse 2, Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. They thought, indeed, they were doing the service of God by killing the true followers of Jesus Christ. This is the height of deception. Therefore, John wondered with great admiration. History testifies that the church indeed persecuted and killed Christians for their faith. Here is an historical quote. Great numbers were driven from their habitations with their wives and children stripped and naked, many of them inhumanly massacred. The History of the Popes, Volume 2, page 334. More than 50 million were put to death by popish inquisitors. F. She sits upon seven mountains, Revelation 17, 9 says, And here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth. Rome was founded in 753 BC on the seven hills, a term used for centuries to describe the Capitoline, Curinal, Viminal, Esquinal, Kaelin, Aventine, and Palatine hills surrounding the old city. The Vatican City sits on one of the sides of Tiber River facing the seven hills. G. She ruled over the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, 18 says, And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Edward Bishop Eliot, an English clergyman, wrote, and I quote, All the kings of the West reverence the Pope as a god on earth. The mighty emperor Charlemagne consented to receive his title and empire as a donation from the Pope, and ere long the coronation oath of Western kings came to include a valve to be faithful and submissive to the Pope. Kings and emperors consented, like our own John and like Emperor Otto and many others, to hold their dominions as vassals of the Pope and to resign them at his bidding. To hold his stirrup and lead his palfrey like servants, to kiss his feet and to bow in his presence like slaves. In his full fame and flushed with victory, the great Francis I of France, in his interview with Leo X at Bologna, just before the Reformation, knelt three times in approaching him and then kissed his feet. The Emperor Henry of Germany, driven to the most abject humiliation by the terror of the papal interdict, sought pardon 
barefoot and clothed in sackcloth and was kept waiting three wintry days and nights at the door of the Supreme Pontiff ere he could secure an interview." Unquote. Hore Apocalypti, Volume 3, page 161. The Washington Post, February 12, 2013, had this to say, I quote, It's difficult to pinpoint a precise moment when the office of the Pope began to lose its vast political power, which had long placed the Holy See above even the kings and emperors of Europe, unquote. The Washington Post, February 12, 2013. Yes. What the Bible predicted has come true, even in this regard, where the papacy would reign over the kings of the earth. Would you like to know God's plan for our broken world as revealed in Bible prophecy? Want practical, trusted solutions for your biggest challenges? Encouraging and enlightening, Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides provide 27 Bible-based topical lessons with beautiful graphics and straightforward answers that are easy to understand. Each study guide leads you toward real, relevant Bible answers for the most important questions in your life. How can I have healthier relationships? When and how will Jesus come again? And so much more. Don't leave your future to chance. Transform your life with truths from the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides. Available in English, Hindi, Tamil, and Telugu. Don't wait. Order your complete set of study guides today by visiting bookstore.aftv.in. Let's proceed to question number five. How do the beasts of Revelation 13 and 17 compare? John wrote, And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Revelation 13, 1. Remember this. The beast of Revelation 13 had seven heads, ten horns, and a name of blasphemy. And in Revelation 17, we read, I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. Revelation 17 and verse 3. Again, you have the seven heads and ten horns and the name of blasphemy. The beast of Revelation 13, verses 1 to 10, and the beast of Revelation 17 are obviously the same. Both symbolize this Roman power. Revelation 17 points out the church-state coalition with the church, the fallen woman, riding and controlling the state, the beast. Revelation 13 also portrays two beasts involved in forcing others to worship. The first beast is the same power as the mother of harlots, described in Revelation 17. This lesson will soon reveal the identity of the second beast of Revelation 13. Let's proceed to question number six. What is the meaning and origin of the word Babylon? After the world was destroyed by the flood, the flood of Noah's days. The Bible tells us many of the descendants of Noah, after a few generations, they departed from God. They did not believe the word of God, which declared that God would not destroy the world again with another flood. So to escape any other global flood that might come, they decided to build a high tower that would go above the tallest mountains so that when the flood comes, they might still survive. This rebellious attitude of the people displeased God because they didn't trust His word. 
God responded to this by confusing their languages and therefore they could not communicate to each other when they were building that great tower and finally the work was halted. They said, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And the Lord said, let us go down and there confound their language. Genesis 14 verses 4 and 7. And then it continues that they may not understand one another's speech. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. Genesis 11 verses 7 and 9. The terms Babel and Babylon both mean confusion. The name originated at the Tower of Babel, built by defiant pagans. Babylon later rose to be an idolatrous world kingdom that persecuted God's people. In the book of Revelation, the term Babylon signifies a counterfeit religious kingdom that is an enemy of God's spiritual Israel, the church. Let's now go to question number seven. How does God describe Babylon in urging his people to leave? The scripture says, And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils. Revelation 18 and verse 2. And it continues, And the hold of every foul spirit, come out of her, my people, that he be not partakers of her sins, and that he receive not of her plagues. Revelation 18 verse 2 and verse 4. God says that Babylon has fallen. The apostle Paul also used the same language he wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3, For that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. The falling away from the truth of God's word was predicted here. And indeed, it happened during the medieval ages when papacy ruled Europe, and Europe in turn ruled the world. Thus she ruled the whole world. Talking about the same power in Daniel 8.12, it states, And it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. The truth was fallen to the ground during this time. Paul also wrote, of the same power and the time of its supremacy. He wrote in 1 Timothy 4 verses 1 and 2, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Yes, spiritual Babylon is a confused system, a mixture of truth and error. Now, Jesus warned that our sins are so offensive that Babylon must be destroyed. God's people must come out quickly or else be destroyed with Babylon's plagues. God has many wonderful people in the mother church and also in the daughter churches who serve God sincerely from a pure conscience. They need to come out of her before God's judgment falls upon Babylon as the Bible predicted. Jesus said in John 10, 16, and other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them must I also bring, and they shall hear my voice and they shall be one fold and one shepherd. Like Lot and his family were hurried out of Sodom and Gomorrah by the two angels from those wicked cities, 
before judgment came down heavily upon them and destroyed them, God's people in the churches of Babylon will be hurried out by the three angels' messages which, which will belt the whole world. Let's go to question number eight. Jesus repeatedly indicts Babylon for making the world drunk with her wine. What is this wine? The scripture says, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations, Revelation 17, 4. It is the abomination or the detestable things, the things that God hates. What does the Catholic Church teach about the chalice or the cup which the priest holds? Let me quote, the chalice is the most important of the sacred vessels, the Catholic Encyclopedia. The ancient kingdom of Babylon also drank the Babylonian wine from the sacred vessels of Jerusalem temple. In Daniel chapter 5 and verse 3 we read, Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem. And the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. The vessels here were sacred from Jerusalem temple, but the wine was Babylonish. Thus the king of Babylon mixed truth and error and made everyone drunk with it. It is like the serpent that tempted Eve to eat of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil. That is what Babylon is, a mixture of good and evil, of truth and error to deceive people. What are some of the major false doctrines, the wine of Babylon, which the church teaches? A. The Ten Commandments are not binding, they say. When God says in his word, it's going to last forever, as Jesus said, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Matthew 5 and verse 18. And the church says it's not binding. B, Sunday sacredness. The word of God teaches about Sabbath sacredness. In the Ten Commandments, God wrote, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Exodus 20 verses 8 and 10. But the Roman church changed it from Saturday to Sunday. C. The secret rapture doctrine. The word of God teaches that when Jesus comes the second time, every eye will see him, Revelation 1, 7. And every year will hear him, Jeremiah 25, 30 and 31. But the Catholic Church brought this doctrine of the secret rapture, which paves way for the coming of Satan, who is going to impersonate Jesus Christ. D the immortality of the soul doctrine. The word of God teaches that death is only a sleep in the grave and man doesn't possess an immortal soul. Only God is immortal, 1 Timothy 6.16. But the Catholic Church teaches the doctrine of the immortal soul, which again paves way to demonic spirits to impersonate our dead loved ones and deceive people. Also prayers to the dead and for the dead are therefore embraced because of the false teaching of this concept of soul. E, eternal torment in hell. The Catholic Church teaches the hellfire is eternal in duration, but the Word of God teaches that hellfire is eternal in result and not duration. 
It will be put off once the wicked pay their penalty in hell. They will die the second death. Well, all the above wine of Babylon, that she has made her daughters also drink with it. And the Protestant churches also believe these unbiblical doctrines. F. Confessing your sins to a priest. The Catholic Church teaches that sins have to be confessed to the priest who is the representative of Jesus Christ on earth. But the Word of God teaches that we are to confess our sins directly to Jesus. 1 John 1, 9 and 1 Timothy 2, 5. G. Counterfeit baptisms. The Catholic Church introduced infant baptism, which is contrary to the Word of God. The Bible teaches baptism is only for believing adults. H. A confusion of tongues. The Catholic charismatic churches are promoting unintelligent tongue speaking, claiming it as the gift of the Holy Spirit and her daughters, the Protestant churches, have embraced it as well. Whereas the Bible teaches us that tongue is a known language that is supernaturally given to communicate the gospel truth to the unbelievers. See Acts chapter 2. The sad truth is that once Babylon's messages are accepted, a person becomes spiritually drunk and virtually unable to understand what the Bible really says because these false doctrines dull a person's ability to comprehend the truth. That's what wine does, isn't that right? Let's go to question number nine. What power will support the beast in the end time? The scripture says, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Revelation 13, 11. And then it continues, And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Revelation 13 and verse 12. Brace yourself. This second beast of Revelation 13 symbolizes the United States of America. Consider the evidence. A. The time it arose. God described this power as a rising up about the same time the first beast goes into captivity and receives its deadly wound. Revelation 13 verses 10 and 11. The United States of America arose about the time of the papacy's power that was broken at the end of 1,260 years, which was 1798. America declared its independence in 1776, voted the Constitution in 1787, adopted the Bill of Rights in 1791, and was clearly recognized as a world power in 1798. So that point fits. B, it arose from the earth. As we have studied before, the waters from which most of the beasts or kingdoms arose represented a densely populated area. Revelation 17, 15. The earth therefore represents the opposite. When it gets when it got its independence in 1776, the population of the United States of America was just 2.5 million. The United States perfectly fits this description as well because it was established on a sparsely populated continent symbolized by the earth. C. It had two horns like a lamb. 
Now, in prophecy, a lamb represents Jesus. This is a lamb-like beast or a Christ-like nation. It means it's a Christian nation. United States, indeed, is a Protestant nation. Also, the lamb Jesus believed in separation of church and state. Remember what Jesus said in Mark 12, 17? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. He taught the people that politics and religion should not be mixed. That is why when God gave the Ten Commandments, he gave it on two tables of stone to make a clear distinction between the laws pertaining to God and the laws pertaining to man. The beast has two horns like a lamb, it says. Horns represent power. Habakkuk 3, 4 says, He had horns coming out of his hands, and there was the hiding of his power. The two great horns represent Protestant principles upon which America was founded, civil and religious liberty. The founding fathers fled from Europe to escape religious and political persecution. They established a society based on the principles of civil and religious freedom, government without a king and religion without a pope. So this point also perfectly fits. Let's go to question 10. According to the prophecy, what drastic change will take place in America? The scripture says, and he spake as a dragon, Revelation 13, 11. Who is the dragon? Revelation 12, 9 says, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. Beloved, from being Christ-like and having Christ-like principles of church and state being separate, the United States is going to change its stand according to prophecy. Speaking as a dragon means the United States will be under the influence of Satan and it will reverse the original Protestant principles of separation of church and state. It will pass religious laws, forcing people to worship contrary to conscience or else be punished with economic sanctions of no buying and selling, and finally death penalty for those who refuse to worship the beast and receive its mark. See Revelation 13, 15 to 17. For more details of what is the mark of the beast, refer a study number 14, the mark of the beast. A nation speaks through its laws or legislative body, which means there will soon come a time where the legislative body will pass the law and the nation will speak through it. The Bible predicts what the U.S. will soon do. It says, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Revelation 13 and verse 14. Let's go to question number 11. What three powers will unite against God's people in the end of time? The Bible says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Revelation 16 and verse 13. The dragon is Satan working through pagan religions. The beast of Revelation 13, 1 to 10 is the papacy. The false prophet in Revelation 16 is the apostate Protestantism in America, which is the same power as the beast of Revelation 13, verses 1 to 17 that had two horns like a lamb, but later spake as a dragon. This is the power 
that does great wonders and deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Revelation 13 and verse 13. Let's go to question number 12. Will these diverse organizations ever effectively unite? The Bible says, For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, 14. Yes, God says they will unite. Notice that they are united in the work of spreading deception and building a confederacy against God's people. The battle of the great day of God Almighty is the same event as a dragon making war with a woman's offspring, as given in Revelation 12 and verse 17. Let's go to question number 13. What effective methods will this end time coalition utilize? The scripture says, for they are the spirits of devils working miracles, Revelation 16, 14. And then it continues, and he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven to earth in the sight of men, Revelation 13 and verse 13. And then it says, he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do. Revelation 13, verse 14. This end time coalition will work mighty miracles by the spirits of devils. And almost the entire world will be convinced and deceived. As you see in Revelation 18, 23, which says, By thy sorceries were all nations deceived. Miracles have been Satan's powerful weapon of deception from the very beginning. Even today, many are falling to this easy bait of Satan, where in Jesus' name, everything happens and the ignorant crowd is getting fooled. Let's go to question number 14. What will prevent God's end time people from being deceived? The Bible says, to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8.20 God's people will need to test everything by the Bible. They will not be deceived because they will test the miracles and teachings to determine whether they come from the spirits of devils or from the Lord. Today, God is calling his people out of Babylon into the safety of his remnant church. He says that those who remain in Babylon will partake of her sins and receive her plagues. In Noah's days, only eight people entered the ark God had provided for their salvation. All others perished. Today, God provides his remnant church as an ark of safety and millions are entering. Jesus is inviting you to come thou and all thy house into the ark, Genesis 7, 11. Will you say yes to his invitation today? Time is running out, beloved. The sins of Babylon have reached heaven and God is soon going to close earth's history and judgments of God will fall. But in his love and mercy, he has sent the three angels messages to call his wonderful people like you who love God and who love Jesus to come out of the false system and worship God in spirit and in truth, for only such worship the Father accepts. 
Let's pray. Dear God, our Father, I thank you for the message. I pray for all who have heard it, that the Spirit would bring deep conviction and people would respond and come out of Babylon to join your remnant church because you're coming for your bride that will be pure and spotless by your grace. I pray that we would never linger, but we would hear your voice and follow you fully. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Friends, just as the church in Berea studied daily the things they heard, we hope you are doing the same thing. Tonight's topic of the other woman was a very deep topic and I hope you will request the study guide. When you do, we will also send you the second study guide entitled The USA in Bible Prophecy. Together, they will help you discover the Bible truth in these messages that you may make the ultimate decision for Christ. To get yours sent to your home, just visit our website or call the number on the screen. And after you read it, be sure to share it with a friend. Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible Study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Visit the Amazing Facts India Media Library at AFTV.in. At AFTV.in, you can enjoy video presentations in multiple languages as well as uplifting material to read, all free of charge, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Visit AFTV.in today.